This episode of the FS Podcast is brought to you by CBS All Access. Looking for a new streaming service to add so you can watch more stuff? Check out CBS All Access. Hit up infospodcast.com slash CBS and you can get a free one week trial to CBS All Access and check out things like Star Trek Discovery, Picard, Survivor, um, you know, all the other cool stuff that CBS has to offer. Star Trek Discovery, I said that already. You should really watch that. Um, yeah, so hit up infospodcast.com slash CBS to learn more. Hey, welcome back to the Infus Podcast. This is Brian. And this is Daryl. I'm so alone. You're so alone. And this is episode 250. Dun, dun, dun. What was that sound I was trying to make? Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. still not sure what you're trying to do. <laughs> It's that horn, that like club horn that they make. Anyway, uh, I think I know what you're yeah. talking about now. Like, anyway. yeah, yeah, I can't. I'm I not can't, even trying. Yeah, that. I'll, I'll, I can. I just do it like. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> 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 Anyways, uh, yeah. So 250 episodes of this nonsense, uh, and obviously this is the infamous podcast versus the apocalypse. Yes, the apocalypse. So. Does that include fire tornadoes? Uh, fire tornadoes, sharknadoes, um, sandworms, you name it, well, it includes it. Well, I, I just say fire tornadoes because I just read that article about fire tornadoes in California. Fire well, whirls yeah. slash fire tornadoes. So, Cal- Northern California is apparently on fire. So, you know, hopefully everybody there is getting out and safe and, you know, they can keep as much of their stuff as yeah. like possibly as humanly possible. Um, yeah. I don't know, man. So, yeah. So this week we are – we've got some news, some good news. Uh, well, not good. I mean some just good news bites. I, I, like the good news is this episode 250. Um, and then uh, – well, there's good news in there about Star Wars. That That's for sure. Um, oh, and, yeah. That's really good news. And then we've each picked um, five movies. I picked five TV shows. You picked four TV shows. And uh, they all revolve around an apocalypse of some kind. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to talk about those because I'm gonna I'll mention some of the ones that almost made it, some of the on my list, as well as some of the ones where I wasn't sure if it was it was technically apocalyptic in a sense, know. but I, not really. I, I almost sent your list so. back to you and said you have to pick different ones than me. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, one of the ones you picked I almost had on my list, or I did have on my initial list. Oh, so. interesting. Well, we'll have to get to that. When Actually, we, when a couple we get I to think, it. Maybe. So. so yeah. But uh, but yeah, so you know, fun fun week happening. Um, you know, let's just hop into it. So the first story is we're we're following up on the the DC crisis that that happened last week. Um, and now my internet decided not to load the story. Anyway, so Jim Lee was was interviewed by the Hollywood Reporter about stuff. Um, and how the 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 future. The company's future is still in the business of publishing comics. Um, I think one of the interesting things is is we found out that about 25% of the comics were not even breaking even. Um, and they're, they're systematically cutting those out between now and the end of the year. Um, and they've also cut 20% of the staff. So that this is very interesting. It's an interesting time for, for DC. Um I don't know. One one of the things is like they they've canceled a bunch of stuff and some stuff that they had on hold they've kind of brought back. Did you read the article? Yeah, and I, one thing I was kind of confused because I know some of the ones, including what like Teen Titans was one of the ones they, for example, that they canceled. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they mentioned uh, some of the stuff going on with Batman and Joker and like some Dark Knight. Uh, I don't know if it's a Dark Knight metal stuff, but that did well and it's yeah they're still going forward with, it, with yeah. those but one of the things Jim Lee did say and I think this was more along the lines of does AT&T still want to be in the comics business is that there's there were there has, hasn't been any what you quote unquote a pencils down order right so like and, and I know so, they do you know the exact exact number of of books titles that they've cut um, I mean, they only so mentioned far, a few in I've there. seen like I think six, maybe it's between six and eight. 
Um, so, sure. and here's the funny thing is DC never put pencils down during the pandemic. They kept going and it's because they, they moved away from diamond. So one of the things I found interesting is, so they were before Dan Didio got fired earlier in the year, there was this whole like G five thing that was going to happen where they were going to do another reboot and it was going to be like heroes in the future. Right. And this was going to be, they, they, these were going to be all the main stories. And one of the books that, that they were going to move forward with was Batman. And it was written by John Ridley, um, who wrote 12 Years a Slave. And he was writing Batman was going to be Luke Fox, Lucius, Lucius Fox's son, who is Batwing in uh, the New 52, who I don't think I've seen in, in Rebirth at all. It was an interesting character, but um, now that's just going to be a mini series, And it's going to be under the Black, um, the black Label books, um, like... Um, strange adventures so i think that's interesting and then they said that they're gonna bring milestone back and it's the label that's gonna yeah. feature un underrepresented heroes and creators so you know it, it, it's funny like so tim pool did a, a really funny video about dc this past week i don't know if you saw it um oh, no, they, I didn't see that. so they went broke and then got woke according to him which i found kind of funny because <laughs> you know a lot of people say get woke go broke and um yeah we're not parodying that i'm just saying that's a saying that's out there um and, and so you know dc dc is definitely struggling and, and hurting and they, they definitely need to reevaluate but i don't think this is the time for them to be like hey let's let's try a whole bunch of let's let's just throw a bunch of diversity spaghetti against the wall and see what happens um i think we're gonna get a lot of batman a lot of batman i mean mostly batman from DC comics, like they might just change it to Batman comics. Um, and I, I'm not okay with that either. And, the, you know, I understand, you know, you have your cash cow and, you know, in Batman and Superman, stuff like that. And I understand that at the same time, there is a real, very real thing of, you know, oversaturation. Mm -hmm. Well, they've even and, stopped including Superman in that talk. It's always Batman and Wonder Woman now. They're not even saying Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. And I, I find that very strange. Um, yeah, well, it's funny you said that because I, I actually read an article oh, where Bane creator Chuck Dixon talks about um, how writers can't tell good Superman stories. Well, okay. That might so be a reason why they're... It's, it's, so, it's true, right? Here's the problem with Superman is he, people perceive him as a really boring character because he's super powered. Right. I mean, there's not a lot that can hurt him, but there are things. And about 100 episodes ago, I, I rewrote the DC universe and how to make Superman interesting. And, you know, I, I think it's you, you have to, like, detach him from Earth for a while and he has to go away. I, the other problem and, and this is and I, I will never forgive Richard Donner for this because it is perpetrated throughout Superman's mythology forever is they kill his parents constantly. And, and the stories where, where they are the most interesting stories are when Ma and Pa Kent are still alive and Clark goes back to them when he has issues of feeling maybe inadequate because he can't save anyone for, for feeling like he's going to lose control or, you know, there's a situation that he needs some sage advice to, to get through. And that shows the actual humanity in the character. And they've turned him more into Cal. You know, Kal El, the the Kryptonian, and 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 that's never been the interesting side. It's always been the man who's more interesting than the Superman. Um, and, and if you look back to like the the John Burns run, Man of Steel run, like he did a really good job balancing the two of those. Yeah, and um, the, and, I'll, and I and I know this, you know, this this is kind of like going a little bit off, but this is a perfect example. So Dixon was talking about these, like the problem that Superman has, and it's not really a problem. It's the problem for the creators. It's a problem for mm -hmm. the writers, yeah. a problem. They don't know how to write good stories about a guy who is a boy scout, a guy who has a yeah. moral spine, a code of behavior. He's a gentleman. He's a paragon of virtue. They simply do not know how to write that kind of character and make it interesting. And that's because the people now, like they want to in insert all these other virtues, um, mm -hmm. if you will, that signal into him and, and the, the idea of him being good and just and virtuous, you know, like people get accused of Superman being a uh, white supremacist. Um, he's an alien. Um, they get accused of him being misogynist. Um, he's a gentleman. You know, it's like there there's you just can't win with some people. So just write him 
that way and people will flock to the book they really mm-hmm. will um i think the interesting thing the other thing that that lee talked about one was the the um the editors in chief marie javins um who headed the digital strategy before and michelle wells who headed the um the young adult imprint um and you know he he says a good thing about how they're a great pairing to bring together to help draft and organize the content that we're doing along these lines across digital across global we want to make sure that we have diversity and inclusivity and making it the way that we have the uh that we have authentic uh, authenticity words are hard to uh <laughs> to the storytelling that we're doing and i think right there it, it's quit shoehorning things in just tell good stories if they're inclusive and diverse awesome that's what people want but don't like don't make that a mandate right like tell the good stories about like diverse and 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 you know included people but don't just do what marvel did because it's it's not fun so the other thing is that there it says here that they're consolidating all their efforts to have every editor to um and having every editor involved in these directives they're also organizing broadly speaking he says in this quote and content that's for kids 6 to 11 and then 12 to 45. It's about consolidating format and oversight into a smaller, more concentrated editorial group. And I personally think that that's going to do nothing but help. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the, the one thing I and I, I had the notes here because I, I, I pointed that out, too. It's like how big like that market for that six through 11. Do they have they have a kind of a, a banner for that already or. Like, do no. they have books like that? I mean, they already? have. I mean, they have like the the or well, they had like the Teeny Titans and you know the Superman and, and family and, and things like that. But I I don't know what they're going to do there. So, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. So I I think that six to eleven is hard. I also think twelve to forty five is a really strange like age range to yeah. go after, um, because there are books that I read that I would not let my twelve year old read, um. You know, and and so I don't know. Part of part of that, it, it's just strange. Um, the other thing is, I would they, think it uh, would be more like twelve to fifteen, and then sixteen to whatever. Yeah, somewhere 16, around there. sixteen plus. You know. Yeah. Um, but right. yeah, I I also find it funny that they said, "Do you have the title of publisher?" And he just answered yes. And of anybody at DC who's not qualified for their job, it's him. He's a fantastic artist. He's a very nice man, but like, he doesn't he should not be the publisher. They need to bring in someone who has actual like publishing experience running a content house and, and not someone who is, who is an amazing artist and, 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 you know, good person necessarily. I mean, the person, they should be a good person, but you know, it's one of those things where like it, it needs to be somebody who's going to hold feet to the fire. Who's going to, who should have cut those books a a year ago. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so it's... he does mention that in September they're going to bring in a general manager mm-hmm. who's like going to focus on what the marketing experience, global partnership, and business development experience. Right. And I don't know if you recall, but there was an article, one of the articles a couple of weeks ago when this all this happened, or last week, I guess, is that they might be looking at someone from the esports. Um, population for this yeah. so i don't know about which, that either you know which i mean was, and again I, that was just could be just a, but that was just kind of to me that was just kind of weird it's like like you said they need like this this position and again i i, I i'm thinking that the general manager and the publisher i don't know if that's necessarily going to be the same thing or no those are gonna be two different roles right so um, um like dan didio like made sense is like he wasn't very good at the job, but he made sense at being the publisher because he had done that. Right. I mean, Jen Lee has right. always been an artist and, and, you know, and that's been his main focus. And, you know, it, he was, he was a founder at, at image. Sure. But, you know, I mean, that was, that was a whole group of, of super creative people who were, who were doing that. Um, I don't know. I, I think uh, if I had to guess in five years, DC will, will, it'll be very different and it probably won't be, they probably won't necessarily be in the business of, of comics as, as a, you know, DC comics will, will exist, but it'll be a much smaller thing. And, it, and it'll really be just Batman and wonder woman and Superman and, and maybe the justice league and a few other smaller titles, but it, it's, it's going to be a fraction of what it is. And, and it makes me sad because, 
you know, DC were the books that I always veered towards when I was younger. And, you know, the new 52, re- actually, I, this is, the, I'm just going to say it. Flashpoint killed that. Flashpoint was the worst thing DC Comics ever did. And you can look at their downfall and you can go back and you can point specifically to Flashpoint when they stopped telling good stories and they started just doing these weird little bullshit things that fans really didn't like. And and all these people were clamoring for like Flashpoint movie, Flashpoint this, Flashpoint that. It's not going to help. No, no, uh, no. Yeah. I remember Flashpoint. Again, I didn't delve into it probably to the depth of you. I, I, I read a decent amount of it. But again, it just it, – it's funny because like the whole DCEU has been for the most part just a shit show. Mm-hmm. And – that the whole the whole it's like they lost their way like yeah. not just the dc but dc in and of itself like just the direction they were doing you know they did the new fit tried the new 52 out you know which again i there were parts of the new 52 i liked i think of the intro mm-hmm. like the first few issues you know i have the trade paperback of that i really like that yeah um one thing they do do well very well are their their, their animated show or their animated um movies yeah uh, Haley's been uh, watching like all of the Batman ones. Like she, she just kind of made her way through like the Batman and Son, Batman versus uh, Rob, Batman versus Robin. You know um, mm-hmm. those ones, and and you know, and she watched uh, Under the Red Hood, and you know, she's just been kind of going through those, and she she kind of forgot how much she liked those. But yeah, you're right. Th- those are great. Like the Green Lantern movies were really good. The the early mm-hmm. Justice League ones were good. Superman versus the Elite is my favorite of anything that oh, they've really ever like that done. Uh, and then All-Star Superman is second. And guess what? Those are two Superman stories that are really easy to tell. Yeah. so I really like this versus the Elite. I like that one yep. a lot. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I don't, want, I, don't want, I don't want to harp on this for too much longer. But um, I, I would like to see them get back on track and, and start telling good stories again. I, I think that... The Joker War is interesting. I think the the whole idea of the three Jokers that they've had running around is a byproduct of just no no real direction on, on what they're doing. Um, and you know the breaking away from Diamond. It's interesting to see from a a production standpoint and a, a direct sales standpoint and how they're gonna support local comic shops. Because I tell you what, if they start like just not supporting local comic shops, I'm done with them just done yeah yeah it's it's gonna be because i know one of the questions they asked him was well, where do you see dc comics in two years or so yeah i i don't know and again i i am not one i've i've been more of a marvel guy mm-hmm. you know from the beginning of my you know young and like I remember my dad would bring you know my brother you know he's eight years older so he was into comics you know so you I, were you were the accident or he was I was, I was definitely the opposite. So, uh, but yeah, he, you know, he has, you know, he had a lot of the Thors and, yeah. uh, like, and that's the like, Thor is the one I remember from, that was like one of the first comics I ever read. Um, so like DC, I would get here and there just if I saw something like, Oh, that's a cool cover. Something. So I wasn't like, not necessarily, I wasn't really into DC collecting. It mm-hmm. was all Marvel. And then when image came out, I did image. Yeah. Then I did, you know, went back and forth between those two, you know, maybe get a graphic novel here and there from DC. But yeah, for people like you who, you know, who grew up on DC, yeah, this has to be a difficult, you know, because you all love these characters so much. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, we all know Nightwing is my favorite character. Dick Grayson is my favorite character in, in all of comics. And, you know, what what they've done to him over the last few years is, is not right. What they've done to Tim Drake, who is the greatest Robin ever, is not right. You know, what they're doing to Damian Wayne right now is not right. And and it's just, I don't know. It, it's a lot of people who, who, they keep bringing in these people who don't understand, like, how to actually tell se- sequential storytelling. And and so they they just make these really short-sighted, short-term things that then somebody else has to fix and then they don't do it right either. I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's, I still love it. I mean, like, the, the actually, the dark metal has been really interesting. I've been enjoying that. Um, the prelude to Joker War stuff and the first few issues are out, which I have to read. I- I've been liking that. 
Um, but yeah, so we'll see. I, I stopped getting Teen Titans because it wasn't good. And there's, there's a reason it's getting canceled. And, you know, I, I, I you know, and, and we can get into that like offline too. some, some other opinions I have on that, but let's move on. So the next story, just kind of sticking with Batman talking about overload is, uh, apparently Ben Affleck will return in as Batman in the flash. Um, which again, I'm shocked that they're moving forward with this movie. This movie has had so much crap with I mean, just and it's, you know, getting the getting the director, getting the script, and then you have Ezra Miller going, you know, I don't even know what you want to call what he you know, some of the stuff he's been up to. I mean, Ezra Miller's oh, not like, good though. I mean, he's not a good actor. Yeah. It's it's just Well well, I'm not even talking about that part. Yeah. <laughs> That's the funny thing. Like and I think, you know, you I know you don't like him as an actor. And I mean I'm I like yeah, I liked him in what did I say, Perks of Being a Wallflower. And I know you said you didn't like yeah. him in that, but I don't like him as Barry Allen. I definitely don't like and again, even in the Justice League, yeah, he had some lines I chuckled at, but overall as a character of Barry Allen I don't see him as Barry Allen. At the, all. uh, the only good part with him in the Justice League was when he was running at Superman and then Henry Cavill turned his eyes and looked at him and he looked yeah, like and, my- and where he looked like he pooped his pants. And yeah. uh, and I think that was just the slack jawed look he always has, um, <laughs> you know, and yeah, it's just I don't know it. <sighs> And again, they're going with Flashpoint with this. You know, he's going to go yeah. through the multiverse. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see Michael Keaton back in, in the Cape and Cow um, if he's a part of it. I I, I didn't hate Ben Affleck as uh, as Batman. I, I thought I, I I really actually liked him in Batman v Superman, even though I wasn't a fan of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Although, again, I've told you the ultimate edition is far superior. I'm but, not. I'm not watching the Ultimate Edition. <laughs> I'm just not. You sound like a surfer right there. I was yawning not, because I was. I'm so, not watching the Ultimate Edition, bro. Uh, no, bro. I'm not watching it, y'all. It's uh, <laughs> the stoke is low. The stoke is low with the Ultimate Edition. Um, but yeah, I did not like how they 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 toned his character down way too much in Justice League. They tried to make him, you know, a quit machine. Yeah. It's and, not Batman. I mean, that's that's Joss Whedon. You know, it's the only way he yeah, knows how to do it. Too, um, yeah. So I'm interested mm-hmm. in the Snyder Cut. But I didn't like how they made him, like, older, how he was a retired Batman. And it's like, no, mm-hmm. no, he should have been. What they should have done is is looked at John Byrne's Man of Steel and made him a year one or two Batman where Superman, like, goes to find him and be like, why are you? Why, I hear you're murdering people in Gotham. And he's like, I'm not killing anybody. I'm stopping crime. Go away. Um <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Ben Affleck, I, I thought I thought uh, of anybody, he, he has the most upside. But mm-hmm. again, they aged the character so much like he could have paid, played a 35 year old Batman and, and it would have been just fine. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, and and then I did like the whole um, CrossFit montage he had. And yeah, um, right. Batman be super cross. So CrossFit I, I'm just interested. I'm interested to see how this kind of because one of the article mentioned how he's going to play. It's going to be kind of like the emotional center because, you know, both characters lost their mothers to mm. murder. I'm pretty sure Barry Allen's mother's not na- name is not Martha. So no, her name is Nora. Be... Nora. Nora. Allen. <laughs> Nora. Why would you say that name? Because that's my mom. Oh, yeah. I was just curious. <laughs> one, one, one of the. So, so uh, I, I, I'll. Um, you know, channel my inner um, Steven Crowder. Uh, that's one of the dumbest lines in the history of comic book movies. Changed my mind. Yeah. It's so dumb. But yeah, I, I like that he's coming back, even though they said it's going to be kind of a cameo role, which again, cameo or yeah. just a short scene, whatever. I, I like this because I just like him as Batfleck. Uh, I like Batfleck. So. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to the good news. Um Thundercats is back on Thundercats, uh, the original in the 2011 are on Hulu. So go watch that. That's enough of that. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so this is a great uh, bounding into comics. I don't know. They didn't share like the original source. I don't think um, had a great article. It might be on here all the way down. The, I mean, this is a super long thing. Uh, no, it does not have the original post. Anyway. Um, so John Favreau, um 
it said like the, just the title is great mandalorian creator john favreau reverses course on how lucasfilm creative deals with star wars fans and the gist of this and we'll get we'll we'll, we'll get pretty deep into this um he is like pointing out the fact that you can't lose your core audience when you mm-hmm. when you when you alienate your core audience you don't have a franchise anymore and you have a movie that made two billion dollars and then the rest of them slowly decline and you have a movie in the midst that only made like 360 million dollars so yeah. and the toys don't sell and people get mad um this is a great article by the way um it, excellent it's, article so john f trent uh, from bounding into comics, excellent work on on putting this together. Um, the the quotes from Favreau are, are awesome. Um, I I love the only one I'm I'm a little like not super stoked about with this cast is actually Pedro Pascal, um, and that was because he he tweeted like kind of a little bit of shade about Rosario Dawson when when the casting rumors came out about her. And I don't mm-hmm. think he necessarily knew what he was doing there. He was just uh, placating fans. So I, but like Gina Carano is a goddamn treasure, and I love her. You know, and and she always, is she's great. I've loved her before she even got into acting. Right. She was a, she I mean, we've been we've been a fan of her since she was a mixed martial arts um, badass. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know they they've been they've been showing the pictures of her and Holly Holm from that fight back in uh it was like 11 years ago um wow and it's like i mean think about it though. that's around the time we started hanging out when was when she was when she was coming on the scene and you know yeah. we were she's actually i think what got us really deep into mma like we kind of liked it but like you know it was like oh yeah like wait there's there's this kind of stuff happening so um but yeah, no, I I, I do want to call out a section like in this article, like there's a there's a section. It's called Ryan Johnson. And then it says Ryan, Ryan Johnson described his critics as, quote, man babies after The Last Jedi was panned by the majority of viewers. And then it goes through a bunch of tweets. What we talk about when we talk about man babies, he would double down on responding to one critic. OK, I have to draw the line at you dragging your Julie little man baby butt across the wheel of uh, the wheel of fortune answers account. Back to the swamp with you, free slash blocked. You know, it, it's it it was that sort of thing where Ryan Ryan Johnson did so much damage to to the 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 people who kept Star Wars alive when there was no Star Wars. The core. Yeah. And one of the things I love, like one of this is one of the first quotes and this is honestly, this is the best summation of what five is saying is you have to feel the energy of the audience. Yeah. Basically you need to read the room, dude. And you know, that that's the thing that all, you know, in this, you know, comp, not just in, not just in movies and TV shows, but comics as well. A lot of people don't do that in the sense of they, they get more on their, I don't want to say everybody does this, so don't get me wrong. I don't think, mm-hmm. it ever, but I think I see it too much. Let's just put it that way: is that they they lose track of the idea of you're you're there to tell a story. Whatever comes after that, that's fine. But the most important thing is to tell a story. Uh, and and what Favreau says is, you know, the idea of telling simple stories. Mm-hmm. Tell the story, and everything that comes within it organically is fine. But when you lose sight of the story because you want to send a message or you want to you know, put your count of X, Y, or Z in there. That's the problem where, where I'm seeing a lot of fans are upset about. Mm-hmm. And there, and yes, there's a difference between some of the harassment that people do versus legitimate complaints. And right. people try to blow up what's har- People try to make like, like Ryan Johnson tries to, you know, frame it. And this is, you know, this is such, so ingenuous, disingenuous, mm-hmm. I should say. And you're tr- there. They try to frame the harassment as the the m- majority of what they're seeing when it's an absolute lie. Mm-hmm. Um, the harassment, just like anything else, they're the t- tiny majority m- minority, in the sense of you know if you have a hundred Star Wars fans, you have maybe five or ten or you know harassers, and then you have those other ninety that are true and right. genuine, 
and they have they have legitimate gripes. Yeah. And and what you do when you do like the man baby thing ruin Johnson, which again I've gotten to the point I'm calling him that, <laughs> and it's it's been, it's taken some time, Brian, but so yeah, I, you know I I'm I'm not a I'm not a full on hater of the Last Jedi. There's some really good I things that were introduced no. in there, and honestly, like. It, like I've been seeing a lot of things where like saying Kylo Ren probably should have been the main character because he was the actual Skywalker in the bunch. Um, and, and I can agree with that to a point, but I wouldn't have wanted to follow the villain. And I like Ray. I, I actually thought Ray was I like a, Ray. Ray's an interesting like Ray. character. Again, kind of like the Ben Affleck Batman with a ton of upside. Right. There's a lot of cool shit you can do with Ray. The problem is, is they they made her OP so OP so fast that mm-hmm. you know and and you know i'm i'm not i'm not calling her a mary sue i don't think ray was a mary sue she grew up on a scavenger planet where she, she had to for fend her, for, she had to fight for her life when 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 people like that and she had a natural ability to fight and the force was always with her whether she realized it or not but when someone like that has something that gives them an advantage and it turns on they just inherently know how to use it and and yeah. you know i still think the biggest mistake they made with ray was she got the best of Kylo at the end of the force awakens where it, it should have been the other way around. So she had something to like some, some a- adversity, which she never really had. Yeah. And, and that, and, and even though, yeah, you could say, Hey, Kylo Ren took, um, you know, a blaster bolt from, um, uh, Chewie from Chewbacca's yeah. bowcaster in right. a leg. And, and like just took it. He no sold it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no sold it it was like Shawn michaels yeah. getting a rko file followed by a punt which sent four uh four other legends out on a stretcher and he just stood up douche yeah so i i think and again i'm you know thinking back to how they handle things with luke and all that stuff like if if last jedi ended like it did with those with those two kind of like coming to a draw like they did yeah. that's fine yeah but to your point i i even though it makes sense that Kylo Ren, yes, he was fighting on one leg mm-hmm. or something like that. It would have made more sense for her to have that adversity of getting beat, or yeah. even if she came close and then him, you know, beating her down or something. Yeah. And then that would have been better for her story arc than what we got. I mean, if they were trying to make like a female version of Luke, Luke was interesting because Vader beat him. Yes, that's like Empire Handily. Strikes a- Empire Strikes Back is uh, like you know and and here's the beauty of empire strikes back it was larry larry uh lawrence caston and irving kreishner who were the writer and director of that it was not george lucas and it was the story was by george and and i've argued for years that's how all star star wars should be story by george you bring in a good writer who's you know knows how to write a good story and you bring in a good director who knows how to direct a good movie um and yeah, but I mean, I'm looking through like Ryan Johnson, J.J. Uh, Abrams, Chuck Winding, uh, some dude named Paul S. Kemp, you know, and just the 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 stuff that they say to, to to fans and and you know, just responding like Chuck Winding has like saying they can all eat oh, shit, I- all of them, they can eat a boot covered in shit, and it's like, why well, why would you say that? And I mean, he's he's. You know, I think, oh, it says here, Wendy would eventually lose his Star Wars gig after threatening violence against supporters of Donald Trump. Like, dude, um, what was it? LeBron said something about he didn't want Donald Trump launching basketball. Um, and Michael Jordan said it best. Republicans buy shoes, too. Right. Yeah. Like when you were an entertainer. <laughs> yeah. And here's the thing. Chuck Winding's books, um, the um, the trilogy that he did the about like the last stand, the Battle of Jakku and stuff like that are all really good. They're really, really good. Um, mm-hmm. He introduced the whole idea of the character that Tim Oliphant is going to play in The Mandalorian. And, you oh, know, I didn't know that. Yeah, and I mean, he, the, the guy has one chapter in each of the three books, and, and yet, like, there's there was enough there to be like, oh, hey, maybe we have something. This is a, this is a story we can tell. And, and it's like, you know, um, again, I, I, like, there's a common theme with all of this. Fucking delete Twitter, dudes. Delete it. Yeah, 100%. Anybody in entertainment, delete your damn Twitter. I mean, it's we don't we don't post like we have there's an automated tweet that goes out from the Infamous Podcast account whenever a new podcast is loaded, but I'm, I'm done with Twitter. We're not posting on I, it anymore. Th- like nothing I and again, I I've said this before. I I to quote Obi-Wan, it's 
a wretched hive of scum and villainy. That's yeah. what Twitter is. So absolutely. But yeah, so I, I, I'm just so happy that that Favreau, you know, he says, but we always, uh, he, he was uh, Favreau then detailed that when creating new Star Wars stories, he he's thinking about core fans. Favreau stated, and this is a quote. But we always knew, and this is something that I learned from. Uh, over at Marvel when working with Kevin Feige is you always want to keep the core fans in mind because they have been the ones that have been keeping the torch lit for many, many years. But these are also stories for young people and for new audience. Bam, right there. You, you, you keep the core fans in mind. You don't alienate them, but you add to it. Case in point, yes. Iron Man. Iron Man was a, at best, C level character. C level Absolutely. character at best. Before 2008, if you asked anybody who was in the Marvel comics in, in the Avengers and you said, Who's your favorite character? I'm going to guess 0.0001% of them said Iron Man. <laughs> yeah, I like I never read Iron Man comics. I uh, never bought an Iron Man there. comic until after 2008. Yeah, I read, you know, I read Thor. I read, I actually read some Captain America, not much. Read the Hulk. Um, but Iron Man was not on that list. Yeah, I was not really on that list. I, I got, I got Hulk. I mean, my, my Marvel books were more mostly the X books and Spider Man. Yeah. But like, I, I got Spider-Man, Hulk, yeah. I got Thor, I got Cap. I love all three of those characters. Iron Man, I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, he's just a, you know, yeah, whatever. He sucks. Um, <laughs> he's just some rich dude. But yeah, and, and, and you know, so. Again, he understood that, and he turned something into it. And, you know, people are going to hate on Iron Man 2 and Iron Man 3, but they're not bad movies. They're really not. They're not great. They're, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But they, they moved and, the MCU along in, yeah. in a way, like, you know, it introduced um, um, Black Widow, you know, R.I.P. And, uh, you know, he didn't have to throw her off a cliff. Dude. <laughs> You're lucky I'm not there right now. I'd, I'd kick you in the shins. Yeah, it's a good there, thing right? we're socially distancing today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, yeah. So I I don't know. Uh, but one and other things like he says, you know, uh, like and I'm paraphrasing here: honor and be respectful of the past. You know, it, it just goes along with your you know you're saying about the you know telling keeping the core mm-hmm. fans in mind, but building on something, building on that. Yeah. And you know, I told you before we started comic the comic book industry needs to read this article and needs to process what john favreau said yep here because they are so um culpable i'm gonna be honest i think Ke- the core fans. I-, I think seeing what we're seeing for phase four and five kevin Fe- feige needs to read this article too um <laughs> yeah kind of, yeah that's this is, you're so, not wrong on that but anyway so all right let's move yeah. on to the apocalypse so um Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> uh, so lots of people are sick and oh wait no not that apocalypse my bad um all fire right. tornadoes in california fire tornadoes sharknadoes sunday 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 you have to say sunday bloody sunday sunday oh, no. bloody sunday anyway <laughs> all right so what we've done is we each picked five movies I picked five TV shows. Daryl, for some reason, only did four, even though he knew he was supposed to pick five. Um, revolving around an apocalyptic event uh, to celebrate the end of the world that we're all experiencing. So let's start with movies. Um, we had one. We only had one movie the same. Yeah. And so I will tell you when you when you um, go well, over your let's, list. Let's let's start. Let's just start with the one that we had the same to get to knock that one out. How about that? OK. So yeah. the 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 crossover event on our list was Mad Max: <laughs> Fury Road, uh, the 2015 Australian post-apocalyptic film, co-written, produced, and directed by George Miller, the fantastic George Miller, by the way. Um, so it starred uh, our girl Charlize. It had Nicholas oh, Holt. It had a, a a very grunty Tom Hardy, uh, Rose Huntington Whitley from the one Transformers movie without Megan Fox. Um, Zoe Kravitz, my Dark girl, my girl Zoe Kravitz was in there, so I'm. All, I forgot. I'm all yeah, good. she's in there. So she's yeah. one of the wives. Uh this was my favorite movie of 2015. When when we did our our year end uh, wrap up, this was my favorite movie of 2015. I I thought it got robbed the fact that it did. I thought it got robbed that it did not win multiple Oscar awards. 
um, for, for acting and directing and writing and, and everything. So yeah, I mean, Charlie's got robbed for best actress. Yeah. I love this movie too. I still remember when I, like, it was so funny because I still remember the first, when I went to go see it, I think I saw it twice actually in the movies, in the theaters. Like when you see that, that first scene where they show, like where they speed up the camera mm-hmm. when, um, when they, when Matt Max gets captured, it kind of yeah. like threw me off. Right. But this is an example of, again, going back to what Favreau said, telling simple stories. You can, you can't get this. This is such a simple story, you know, point A to point B, yeah. point B to point A, basically. And here's the thing but, too, is it kept the core audience in mind? Yes. Cause there, this, this wasn't a new film. This was a movie that, that came in with an existing IP that had a ravenous cult following. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm, you know, again, Mad Max, the Mad Max series is one of those that I followed when I was younger. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe we I shouldn't have watched them when I was the age a, I was, but we didn't need another hero. We didn't need to find our way home. We had Mad Max. Thunderdome and the Thunderdome, which yeah. WWE is totally stealing right now. The idea of Thunderdome anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean this, it's, it's a fantastic movie. It's beautiful. It is. It is. The visuals are incredible. It's amazing. It is a. It is a just, you know, everyone talks about like Avatar, right, and how its visuals are awesome and stuff like that. But Avatar is essentially a cartoon, right? This, like the visuals in this, and the cars, and the the practical effects mixed with the, the CGI and and how like how many practical effects they did for these amazing car stunts where they only had one shot to do it. It's so impressive. I can't like talking. About it, I really want to again. I really want to like, screen. I should say to be honest. Do what you broke up there. Because, no, oh, I said um, talking about this makes me want to watch it again. Yeah. More so on the big screen because again, this is one of those movies. Man, watching this on the big screen is great. Yeah, it's D- fantastic. Did you ever watch experience. the? Did you get um the Chrome version where it was? It was like a chrome, like black and white, kind of like chromish sepia tone color where they took out all the color. Um, I think I have that on there, but I never watched that version. Dude, it, it, it is. It's the only way I watch it now. Really? Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is so cool. So um, I would love for them to do more of this. Yeah, it's called Black and Chrome. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was it was really interesting. I, I really I really love it. It adds so much. It's like if you watch. um the original night of the living dead in color you're you're not you're 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 doing yourself a disservice you should watch it in the original black and white so um, it's funny you say that because you know i told you about the ghost of shushima yeah which by the way i just got platinum trophy on wow it's my first ever platinum trophy game congratulations I 100% it. yeah Congrats. spider-man I, i'm at 91 percent, so i might um, go back and get that 100%. I'm, I'm still at 37 percent on spider-man Boo, we call yourself a Spider-Man fan. You know, anyway. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I I'm going to be honest. Uh, it's a really good game, but it is the PlayStation 2 version of Spider-Man 2. You, you just, said that a couple it, times. It, it me, is. Yeah. It's the same. It's like literally Doc Ock is the bad guy and or one of the bad guys. And he's, you know, he loses his whatever. He gets the, the arms and stuff. And yeah, it's just, I don't know. All right. So, um, anyway, like Ghost of Tsushima, real quick. Yeah. It has what they call a Kurosawa mode, oh. you know, for the famed director, which it everything is in black in that black and white. And I'm oh, going to go awesome. back and I'm going to check that out. Hell yeah. You got to do the Kurosawa mode. Cool. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to your uh, your next movie pick. So this one, again, another, you know, Book of Eli. Love Denzel, first of all. Um, you know, Gary Oldman as, you know, the antagonist in here. Um, you had, what's her name that was in that? Uh, um, I've never seen Book of Eli. You've never seen Book of no, Eli? No, I know. It's really weird. It's been on, like, streaming services a lot, and I've just never watched. I've actually put it on my watch list and just never watched it. Yeah, Mila Kunis is in it, Jennifer nice. Beals, Ray nice. Stevenson, Michael Gambone. But... You know, another, it's one of those other movies, so I won't, um, it does have a M. Night Shyamalan type twist in it. What did we say? But, you know, some really good action. And, you know, Denzel just, can, he just, can, every time he's on the screen, like, doesn't matter what movie he is, he just, like, 
command attention. He has yeah. that, and it's the same way in this movie. Now, is again, he, it's, is he just Denzel in this one, or is it actually like some acting happening? Oh, there's some acting, but okay. he's also Denzel. Yeah, uh, I I really enjoyed this movie. You know, the fighting is brutal, and cool. it's an unforgiving world. Uh, I I really, yeah, I. I Really, you should. You need to take a take yeah, a look at this. Yeah, I definitely. Take it's it's, a, it's always been one that's on my radar that I need to watch. Um, what's your favorite Denzel movie? Ah, uh, man, I don't know. That's a tough one. I I, I um, I I I was a big fan of Deja Vu. Loved him in Training Day. Um, I, I really I, uh, one of the underrated Denzel movies is Two Guns. Him with uh, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. I really like that movie. Which and, I, and again, it's one of those movies I didn't even realize it was a comic until yeah. after I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like uh, Ricochet with him and John Lithgow. Oh, uh, dude, that's an old school. And then uh, obviously remember the Titans, and then oh. um, Man on Fire. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, cool, cool, cool. All right, so my next one is this is the end, or my I guess my first like non crossover is this is the end. Um. The Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, um, Hollywood uh, apocalypse movie where the the biblical po- apocalypse actually happens um, when Jay Burchell shows up in L.A. to visit Seth Rogen and they go to a housewarming party by James Franco and just all hell breaks <laughs> loose. Um, so one, I love Jay Burchell, right? I love him. I, I've I've yeah. I watch anything that he's in. I'm I'm such a huge fan. Um, Two, I love Seth Rogen. Um, An American Pickle is a great movie. Um, the Long Shot, actually, I like. I don't know. I went on. I really like the Long Shot. I really liked it too. I went on a little Seth Rogen mini marathon. I rewatched Pineapple Express and and stuff like that. Um, and and you know, I mean, this is it's based on Jay and Seth versus the Apocalypse, which is a short story uh, or a short film that uh, Seth and and um, Evan Goldberg wrote. So, uh, and it was, you know, starring Jay Bichelle and everything. Jonah Hill is fantastic in this is the end though. Um, what happens to him is hilarious and it's just, it's, it's super, super, super funny. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just one of these things where it's, it's so wrong. It's super rated R. I mean, it's super rated R. Um, but it's fun. It's just a fun end of the world comedy, which, you know, we need more of. Yeah, and, and it's funny because that was one of the that was one I almost put on my list. Oh, really? Okay. The, yeah. Oh, this is the one and you it, almost put on. Or yeah, and it's and it's yeah, it's one of those because and there's actually I was debating between and and it, neither one made the list. Um, another one of yours on there. I won't give it away. But one thing I like about this movie is just it's just like the ri- ridiculousness of it in the sense of these guys they're playing themselves. Yeah. Which, oh, yeah. That's what I like about like that's one of the things I really like. They're just mm-hmm. playing, you know, hopped up versions of themselves for lack of a better term. Yep. I, I just, will like say said, just a fun comedy. My my list um t- 2013 is highly represented on my list. Um <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. All actually. right. What's your what's your next one? Um 28 days later. Great movie. Great movie. Yeah. I saw this. This was one of those movies that kind of like re introduce me to the zombie world the world you know the, the world of zombie movies and like dawn of the dead came out a couple years after this um in 2004 i believe and so you know you have Cillian murphy you know naomi, naomi harris and it, it's funny because I, this came out before the walking dead comic mm-hmm. i think um, um 2000 like two, i think 2003 was this walking was dead comic. yeah this was 2002 so when Cillian Murphy's character again, he was a, like I think he was a bike messenger, and he gets hit. Yeah, he's in a coma, and he wakes up. Like you imagine waking up to just total chaos. No, I can't. Like that. That's like literally a nightmare I have. Yeah, like you don't know what's going on. Like that's probably you know being able to like if, if the world fell into chaos and we're you know we're, we're experiencing it uh, not now i mean but just like in general like zombies and stuff like that you see it happening it's frightening but you yeah. know what's going on imagine being a character <laughs> just being in a, in a coma for 20 you know right. for a month or so 
you know, you went, you went, you got hit by a car. Everything was fine. Mm -hmm. You wake up and then you have people just like slap slavering at the mouth yeah. again. This is the thing. I t <laughs> fast zombies are the most unfair thing. They're out not there. zombies. They're rage monsters. I, I, they're they're yeah, mini they're on green hulks. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> they're they're in the <laughs> they're in the zombie genus. No, they're many they're saying. many ungreen hulks. That's what I've always many called them. <laughs> so, because they're they're full of rage. That's their secret. They're always angry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, Danny Boyle really, too. I mean, and, Great director. Danny Boyle yeah, is awesome. And the tension here, and and again, Alex Garland. I didn't realize Alex Garland uh, wrote the Dread screenplay from the 2012 Dread. Okay. Um, and, you know, he's done uh, Ex Machina. He's done some. He actually Great did a movie. couple episodes. I love Ex Machina. Annihilation, the, mm -hmm. he did the screenplay for I that. I didn't watch that one yet. It, that was on my list. That's that always been on my is, list, too. Yeah, that's a good movie, but I could see why some people wouldn't like it. But I, I did like it. I think um, I, I just avoided that because it's Natalie Portman. And, I, I like, she's hit or miss. But so. you do have Oscar Isaacs in it. You have uh, Tessa Thompson in it. Oh, Tessa Thompson's in it. Well, now I'll definitely yeah. have to watch it. Uh, I watched both her but, Creed movies the other day. <laughs> did, have you done that? Like, how many times have you seen those? Um, this year, just like five. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, didn't you tell me that a few weeks ago? Yeah, if Creed? I get bored, I just put Creed on. Like, it's I love <laughs> I, it, like the soundtrack of it, and like just kind of like mm -hmm. everything that's happening while I'm working. Since I start working again, you know, like Creed yeah. is just a a great little like I don't know, ASMR thing to pay attention to what I'm doing. Um, is it now? Is it now? Is it now? Super. <laughs> okay that's kind of creepy, creepy. okay <laughs> all right uh my next one uh also from 2013 it's pacific rim um we went to go see that we did go see this uh it's it's kaiju versus jaegers man i mean giant robots versus giant monsters you can't go wrong i think this is yeah. guillermo del toro's best film um hands down and and even though he won an oscar for a fish man having sex with the lady um you know this uh to me this is this is my favorite Guillermo del Toro film I I, I literally like could say if someone's like um I, you, I you can, if you want to keep Pacific Rim you have to get rid of Hellboy Hellboy 2 um uh Pan's Labyrinth and um the fish man and his girlfriend fine fuck them all I don't care I I, I this is another one and Haley and Ooh. I can sit and watch this one over and over and over again as well um you know Charlie Hunnam is great in this. Idris Elba like is at his most badass. Um, we're canceling the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's got Charlie Day, who I love. I just Charlie Day is one is just um, an actor who I I I just love so much, and he's very funny in this as Newt. Um, but yeah, it's and he, yeah, Mercury. His partner was Mercury. Yeah, Mercury, yeah. Or Burn Gorman. Burn Gorman um, <laughs> from Torchwood. That's when I first saw Burn Gorman in when he he. Uh, I think I first saw him in um actually Game of Thrones in season. Oh yeah, oh okay. Two or three. Yeah, I mean he was in Torchwood like in like 2006. So. Well, I didn't. I never yeah. watched Torchwood. Oh, dude, that the first couple seasons of Torchwood were really good. Um, you know, but it, it's just really fun. It had Max Martini from the the unit who I always love. Um, showing I up. I love that show, man. Gypsy Danger. Yep. Strike a Eureka. You know, it's just fun to say the names. Um, Stacker yeah. Pentecost. Like, it just had such cool names for, for people. Um, yeah. You know, and, and then you, yeah, you had uh, Ron Perlman show up. It, it's just, it, it's a fantastic cast. It's a fun movie. It's super stupid. Like, that, the idea yeah. of it is there's a breach in the ocean to another dimension. Awesome. You know, um, it, it's kind of like another Charlie Hunnam movie that I like. Uh, King Arthur Legend of the Sword. You just turn your brain yeah. off for for ninety minutes, and or well, this one's uh yeah about ninety uh, one hundred and thirty two minutes. So two hours and twelve minutes, and you just turn your brain off and you enjoy it. Yeah, I, I don't even turn my brain off. I just l love the spectacle. Like, yeah. and again, it's kaiju versus monster, yep. or kaiju versus big robots. You you had like, me at robots fighting monsters. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I remember when I first saw the you know the trailer for that. I'm like, I'm in, I'm I'm in. Like they say, you son of a bitch, I'm in. <laughs> All right, what do you got next? So what I have next is Edge of Tomorrow, which is great. We've uh, talked about that one on the on the show before, 
um, which is why I did not put it on my list. Um, so terrible marketing, terrible, terrible marketing. marketing, fantastic movie. I, I remember going to see this and I think it was one of those, I got, uh, a free passes and there were actually several several of my friends went to go see it like separately like we were in the same theater and i i thought it was just going to be you know a little cheesy i i didn't know what to expect again because of the the marketing w- was terrible mm-hmm. i thought the trailer was interesting but still i'm like okay this is going to be eh. uh, is, is this going to be another oblivion or whatever um which again that's another tom cruise i movie. really it like oblivion why are you I bashing did, oblivion and and I almost put Oblivion I, on my list, but we talked about that one too say, in the past. <laughs> All right, can I can I can I get a word in? No. <laughs> what? I, and I was gonna I was gonna say I didn't hate Oblivion. I actually didn't think it was a terrible movie. Yeah. I just it just underwhelmed me. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things. Cause again, that's one of those I want to you know to see by myself. Oblivion, but Edge of Tomorrow, Tom Cruise. You have Tom Cruise. It's mm-hmm. Tom Cruise. Yeah, Tom Cruise yeah. in it up. You have Emily Blunt, who's probably – I don't know if she, – she's in my top five. Um, I don't know where she is along – you know, you have Scar Joe's number one, Charlize Theron probably number two. She might be number three, Emily Blunt, because she's, like, nice. very yeah. diverse. Oh, yeah. Uh, all, like, all of those are – so I just love that idea about, you know, aliens manip- that manipulate time. So mm-hmm. it was like you have the enemy who – the hardest enemy is the one who knows how you can beat it, and they can, you know, they can stack the deck against you and, you know, put mm-hmm. those extra cards in the deck. Yep. And I, I just love that idea and how Tom Cruise gets caught up in it. One of my favorite aspects of this is, you know, he's this quote unquote salesman basically. Yeah. And he gets put on the front line. Yeah, He's a PR he, guy. <laughs> yeah. And he looks at, at exactly like a PR guy would look who's never been in the battle mm-hmm. before. I, it, and <laughs> the fact that he continually dies over and over and over and over again. And then that's how he ups his skill set. It's, right. It's pretty cool. And, you know, great action. You have some good stakes. You have some good comedy in there, too. Um, yep. Bill Paxton is in that. Yeah. forgot about that. Doug Lyman, man. Uh, great, great, great job directing this one, too. Um, yeah. I love, like, for this one, it had me at the Groundhog's Day thing, right? I love anything that's yeah. like a Groundhog's Day, like living the right. same day over and over again. And it's funny, like, after watching, like, Endgame and stuff and thinking about all the divergent timelines he created – Yes. Yep. So, but yeah, good one. Very, very good. All right. So closing out my, my 2013 run of movies, uh, the world's end, which is the, um, the Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Edgar Wright, um, <laughs> close out of the, the Cronetto trilogy. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's the most British, <laughs> Um, apocalypse movie of all time. It's a bunch of forty-year-old guys going on a pub crawl. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's another good, good movie, man. So, I, I like this. Um, and I'm I'm not gonna go too too deep into this one, but I love uh, well, oh, Roseman Pike is in this, and she's in my like top ten for actresses. For oh, sure. I love her too. She's really really yeah. good. Um, but it's Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Patty Constantine, Martin Freeman, who is fantastic in his role, and then Eddie Marsan. Um as as the the group um that that are in there and you know coming off of hot fuzz which was the best of the cornetto trilogy for sure like this one had like a really it, it could have been a, a huge letdown i think for some people it might have been but yeah it probably was yeah um gary gary king is might be my favorite simon Pegg character um <laughs> <laughs> he's just so messed up. And then the way this movie ends with the androids and him going off with the younger version androids of the group um, to rove the apocalyptic wasteland it is the best ending to a movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that this was another fun movie where, I didn't, you know, I, I, I was late to the whole, you know, Simon Pegg train kind of, uh, I remember seeing, you know, Shaun of the Dead. I watched, Shaun, I've, I've watched all, well, I've watched all the, of the trilogy. So yeah, uh, this was one of those that I, I think I saw, I didn't see like right away. I think this was, I saw like a year or two after it came out, okay, but okay. you know, it's, it, it was enough. It was a fun time, man. It's just, it's fun time. 
Yeah. So, I mean, th- I saw I saw all of these in the theater. Um, and, you know, I was a big fan of Spaced before any of this stuff came out. Uh, mm-hmm. Just because I don't even remember how I found out about Spaced. It was when we were at Fidelity, right? And right. Uh, I had my little, I had my 5G um, video iPod. And I would just like, you know, torrent British TV shows. So I had like Doctor Who, Spaced, like, you know. <laughs> faulty towers shit like that and i would sit there and while i would work i would just have my little ipod in this little dock and, and i'd have my headphones in and like watching listening to i actually to remember space. that yeah so and, and space was like <laughs> it because it was it was only 12 episodes and they were a half hour and it, it would pretty much you know go through the whole day um but yeah cool all right what's your last one rain of fire this is enough this is a, a <laughs> one of those near and dear to my heart <laughs> Dude, we're we're, we're looking. Like we were hold on, hold on. We're looking for the magic hour. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking for the hour where the dragons can't see. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Dude, McConaughey like with the beard. And I've been I've been working head. I've been working on my McConaughey just just after I saw you playing. <laughs> I've been sitting here. I was like I'm pra- I was practicing. <laughs> Like we talk about kaiju and you know big ro- robots. Oh, dragons, robot dude! Fights. Dragons, dragons! Like you, you pretty much have my like, like they said, you you have my attention. Now you have my interest. Yeah. But you know, you have Christian Bale, Gerard Butler. Yeah. The, what, one of the few like really good Gerard Butler roles. Like this is a movie that even Gerard Butler couldn't ruin. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> think about it. 300 that, that's the other one um i know i olympus has fallen i really like olympus has fallen uh the first one i mean i've liked all three of them to some extent um the second one is the weakest of the the trilogy which it's not going to be a trilogy i think they're going to make more oh god but, <laughs> I'm, I'm... <laughs> but i i really like the first olympus has fallen um yeah. then there's ps i love you there's a <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I, I kind of like that movie too. Of course you do. It's fine. <laughs> but this one, I mean, I even I was just you know looking at some video clips or some YouTube clips of scenes, and even back then, it was made in 2002, I think. Uh, yes, 2002. The, the the CG for the dragons is pretty dang good. Yeah, the um, dragons were awesome. I mean, everything, and and the fact that they had different kinds of dragons. Yeah, it wasn't just all and, like one dragon. Yeah, and it's funny because you know the, how the dragons destroyed everything. It's it has this medieval type feel to it, not just because they're living in the castle. Which, again, one of my favorite scenes is where the dragon just gets ticked off and then just burns the castle to the ground, mm-hmm. pretty much. And there's a scene of like the dragon sitting on top of the castle as it just just burns, just fl- it's just up in flames. It's right. a great shot. Yeah. Now. Um, like it's just such a fun, good movie that, and how they, you know, discover, you know, these were these were the things that killed off the dinosaurs. Yeah, right. It was pretty. I mean, it, I just love that the idea of this, and you know, I like the execution. Yeah, and, and the whole idea of the Bale, magic hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I just like saying that. My, my favorite thing was the angels, um, and yes. what was it? Their life expectancy was fifteen minutes. Um, yeah, that was that was really cool. Yeah, that I mean, I just really like this movie. Yep. Um, cool. Yep. All right. Uh, my last one is another movie we went and saw together, Zombieland. Um, and this was this was leaving the uh, the 2013 genre, so heading all the way back to 2009. <laughs> um, you know, it th- this one this one had me at Woody Harrelson, Jesse Eisenberg, Emma Stone, and Abigail Breslin. You know, it just it was super nerdy. Um, it it made a ton Cardio. of money it was sorry cardio, cardio. yeah you know I, the rules were great double tap cardio um you know uh I, and i like jesse eisenberg i i'm not gonna even apologize for it i like i like jesse eisenberg i watch almost all of his movies or whichever ones i can get my hands on um yeah. and yeah bill murray in this his little cameo yes. was great uh but yeah and, and like the cool thing about this was the the zombies were just typical zombies, right? But the zombie kill of the week, because at no point were we ever led to believe these were the only four people left on Earth. It's just unlike The Walking Dead, people just completely avoided each other. 
Mm-hmm. So, but but getting that the clips of zombie kill of the week, like the old lady dropped the the piano on the zombie. <laughs> yeah, when, and and I loved it when uh when Woody Harrelson kills him, he goes zombie kill of the week, and it's like actually the zombie kill of the week was by Florence Henderson, and the, yeah. you know, and it was really funny. That wasn't Florence. I love Henderson, when movies I couldn't think do of the old stuff like that. Where it's just yeah. you know, it's, it's there to entertain. It's not taking itself seriously. Uh, like, it, even it's a fun comedy. fourth wall break. Yes, that's what I I like though. At times. Yep. All right, uh, so we're we're over an hour already, and we still got TV series to get to. Um, so we both had uh, two of the same. So yeah. we'll start with BSG. Um, oh man, it, it is Love it's a, it's a multi apocalypse series. Yeah. So there's the apocalypse the apocalypse on the thirteen colonies, and then there's the apocalypse on New Caprica. <laughs> like these people just can't get away from it. Yeah, and I know we've talked about this before. BSG has one of the best opening episodes of any TV show I've ever seen. Okay, so I, I've told the story before. I did not watch the miniseries because I was still butthurt about Farscape getting canceled, and I was boycotting the Sci-Fi Network. Um, <laughs> and then we were living in the apartment and uh, up here and – it was like Friday night and I had nothing to do and I was flipping through and, and the episode was just about to start. And I was like, wait, Battlestar Galactica. And uh, I had no idea they'd done, even done the, the, uh, the miniseries at that point. So 33 was my first introduction to all of this. That's and, a perfect introduction. Dude, like honestly, I didn't watch the miniseries until I bought the first season on DVD. Yeah. So – yeah, it, it's I loved I love everything about Battlestar Galactica. I I was not I was not like super disappointed in the ending. I thought it was interesting. I wasn't either. I thought it was kind of cool that they were our ancestors, that they mated with the you know they're the reason Homo sapiens came about. Um, I thought that was really really interesting. Um, but yeah, I it, it's it's a great apocalypse story, and and it's a great it, it's it's. It's this weird multifaceted like political drama in space. <laughs> yeah, it, it and it's it um, as much as any other show goes with the idea that people are we're our own worst enemies, but we're also our greatest hopes to, as well. Right. Um it, it's just well done. Like some of the characters and again, I remember the I used to watch the original Battlestar Galactica back in the day as a kid. So. And after this came out, that became unwatchable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like, but I remember hearing about this show. Um, and again, you were the one that tur- you kept telling me, watch this, watch yeah. this, watch this. And I just kept thinking of the original and I'm like, I don't want a stupid reboot of it. You know, I do that sometimes. Starbucks. But, uh, a, yeah. I remember when you're like Starbucks, a girl. Ugh, gross. Yeah. And <laughs> girls can't play boy characters, Brian. Girls can't play boys characters. And I was like, Daryl, it's awesome. It's Katie Sackoff. And better yet, you have Grace Park as Boomer. Oh, I love Grace Park. I love Katie Sackoff. Yeah, both of them are great. Trisha, Trisha yes. Helfer. You got Hilo. Uh, you had Hilo, man. You had Lee. Dude, that was my dude. Hilo you had was Fat my Lee. dude. Dude, Hilo, yeah. Hilo was the best character on the show. Even though Lee was yeah, my favorite like, character. Yeah, he was my favorite, yeah. Hilo was the best and, character uh, on the we, show. And remember, our boy uh, Crashdown was in it, too. Dude. Sam Whitworth. Pour one out. Poor Crashdown. So, yeah, so this show anyway. was just like had everything for yeah. me. You know, it had you had the – oh, and let's not forget the space battles, which actually used the four dimensions of 4D space. 4D fighting. And, you know, let's – Star Wars, take some notes. Um, yeah. All right. So moving on to the next one uh, that we have in common, Battlestar Babies, um, the hundred. <laughs> so uh, I have not watched the final season yet, but I Me neither. I really love this show. I think it should be hitting Netflix almost any time now. Um, I love this show. I think it's great. I was super late to the party. I didn't start watching this until the third season was almost done airing, um, and I have just. I've I've rewatched the first couple seasons a few times and it's it just it it's so much fun. Um the whole the whole way they kept growing the mythology of the show and the survivors of the human race and again another multi-apocalyptic show. Mhm. So. And again, you know, the first thing I remember about this the first episode, you know, Imagine Dragons song was in it, but uh <laughs> 
No, but this is a show, and and again, we've got, we've gone back and forth about this show because one of the things I like and love and you know loathe sometimes is the characters tend they do things that really piss you off. Yeah. It's just like, and and I actually again, even though at the time I don't like it. It, it makes it show that they are actually a well-formed character. Yeah. You know, did they're you not read the just books? There. No, I did not. I didn't read the books either. But it, it just shows it, – it does that character – and similar, again, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of funny we both have this in BSG because they do similar things with the characters mm-hmm. in the sense of they are well-rounded. And again, another space show does this is The Expanse where you're like the characters are so well done that – you love them, but at times you're like, oh, "How dumb can you be? How dare or, you?" Not necessarily. That's what not you think. You something. just think, "How dare you?" Yeah. How dare you? Because <laughs> I say that about like the the biggest one is Clark, and again, because she's no, you know, she's no. The biggest one is Abby. Abby, like, oh. like Cl- the the mistakes Clark makes are inconsequential to just the boneheaded decisions Abby made. Up until you know her ultimate demise at some point during the series. Uh, you know what? You're right about that. Oh gosh. Uh, and, and and followed closely by Marcus, uh, Marcus Kane, played by Henry Ian Cusack. He made a bunch of boneheaded choices too. Um, yes. my favorite but, character yeah. on the show is Octavia, though. I think um, her much, growth. Yeah, her growth. Much like Damian Wayne in the comics, her growth was amazing. Um, and then I like Bellamy. I always like Bellamy. I thought he was an interesting mm-hmm. character too because you it, you thought he was going to be a bad guy at first, and he literally became like the ultimate like white knight with a like terrified of everything. Like, but I'm going to hook up with any girl I can, like Jim Kirk complex. <laughs> and Clark, I love Clark. But, I mean, Clark is the heart and soul of the yeah. show. Um, yeah, Eliza you didn't Taylor mention your boy. Awesome. Which one? Um. I'm drawing a blank now. Monty? Uh, not Monty. Uh, John. John, yeah. John's not really my boy. Um, I, I just like to root for John because he's the uh, the underdog. Um, you know, it had uh, Devin Bostic as Jasper, so he was uh, Roderick from the uh, the Wimpy Kid movies, which it was really interesting to see him do that. Um, but no, I, I thought this show was great because it had actual stakes. There, were, no one was safe. Like other, you knew no one was really safe other than Clark. Um, because yeah. you know Bellamy, there were times where you thought they're actually gonna kill Bob Morley's character off. Octavia, you thought like for a few times you thought she died. Um, they kept trying to kill Jasper from the first episode on. Like it seems like they tried to kill him all the time. Monty was a great character. Raven, I forgot about Raven. Raven was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. John Murphy by Richard, uh, played by Richard Harmon. And then it was um, this. I feel like this show with uh, Jaha with uh, Isaiah Washington was a nice little uh, rebuilding for him after everything that happened on Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, I was I was telling one of my friends who's a huge Grey's Anatomy fan about like some of what happened when he left. I guess she didn't know about it. And mm. I was breaking it down. And I, yeah, I, the, it, it was a nice little um, kind of you know, like you said, rebuilding. Yeah, I, I really do like this show. I I do think some of the later seasons, particularly last, I'm, I wasn't a huge fan of last season to be honest. Uh, really, six. I liked it. I thought it was a good little change yeah. of pace no, I, and and using I, I, the I, chips and stuff like that was cool. Yeah, I didn't mind. No, actually, that part I just there. It, it's kind of like it was like going back in that same circle to me. Yeah. Um, so again, it it wasn't. It definitely wasn't one of my favorite seasons. I, yeah. I didn't. I didn't think it was bad in the sense, but like if I compared it, it would be one of my least favorite seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I'm interested to see where season seven takes this sure. show. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, what's uh, what's your next one? So this is a show that was only on for two seasons, uh, Revolution. Uh, great start to this show. Um, and uh, kind of it flamed out. Uh, and what I mean by that, the first season. So the premise is, for some odd reason, the electricity all over the world goes out per- permanently. Did they ever tell you why the electricity went out? Yeah, they, 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 they do explain it. Um I don't like the details of like what this cabal or whatever was trying to do. I, I don't, I don't remember like the, the total specifics, but it was just a great idea. So the store, the actual show takes place 15 years after the lights went out and you know, you, people were living in, you know, just regular colonies like you would see in like the 1800s, except, you know, with modern day stuff in the sense of clothing and 
housing because they just, you know, just like the walking dead, how they, you know, mm-hmm. find houses. Okay. We're going to live here. So, and one of our, you know, one of our favorites, uh, Giancarlo Esposito, yep. he, you know, he's one, he, he was in the show and you know, he's an awesome character. I mean, he's just, he's okay. He's awesome in pretty much everything. Yeah. Did, I, so. There's very few things he's not awesome in. Yeah. So, you know, the idea is the whole mystery of season one is figuring out what happened with the power. Mm-hmm. Um, because the main character, um, played by Tracy, I don't, like I can't pronounce her last name, but she actually played uh, the she she actually played um, Friday, I believe. Not Friday, but um, she was the voice of and I think uh, Tony Stark. Like when he, it might have been Friday. Yeah, I think it was Friday when um, Tony, you know, when Vision or when Jarvis turned into Vision, she was the voice of that. But like the idea is her trying to find her uncle and then. You're trying to figure out because her father actually knew what happened and he uh-huh. dies. That kind of like sets, he dies in the first episode, 15, you know, 15 years, you know, mm-hmm. and this kind of like starts her journey trying to figure out what happened. Is they this the one where her brother to, had asthma or whatever? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was played by guess who? By Evan from um, Atypical. Yeah. Yeah. So I really liked the first season of this. And then, you know, as they find out, they tell the turn back on the power, then they find this guy, Colm Fiore's character, who mm-hmm. is, quote unquote, a patriot and wants to do, a, you know, a nuclear strike on Atlanta and Philadelphia and a, the other places. So what happens is to stop the strike, they have to turn off the power again. So uh. and that's why, like, the second season, it, it just kind of rehashed some of some of the storylines from season one and. So I really liked season one. Season two, it was one of those where it just kind of, it kind of lost steam, and that's why it got canceled. Yeah. And, but I, I just really love that idea. Well, I don't love the idea of all the power going out and all the electricity going out, but yeah. just the idea from a show standpoint, I really, I really appreciated that. I, uh, I tapped down on that show when they introduced President slash General Monroe, who was played by David Lyons, who was in that horrific show, The Cape. Um. And that's I when I stopped. It. Yeah, it was really bad. And for whatever reason, I watched a whole bunch of it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so no, I, I only watched part of the first season. So but I, I remember it did start really good. Yeah. And that's uh, I, I think a lot of shows have had that issue where like Flash Forward was another example of that, where I love the concept of Flash Forward. And it just kind of. Yeah, it petered out, buttered out. So, yeah, so my next one kind of falls under that category as well. Uh, Falling Skies, the TNT space drama. Um, the first three seasons, 100% in. I was all in. Love the show. I, I think it should have ended at season three, to be 100% honest. Um, mm-hmm. It was great. No Wiley as Tom Mason. Moon Bloodgood was in there. Um, you have Drew Roy. I don't know if you remember him. He played Hal, the oldest child. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Um, he was on your show, one of your shows that you have left here. Um, but uh, you know, in in Will Patton, who you know, I'm 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 a big fan of Will Patton as well. Yeah, I like yeah. Um, and then you had uh, what's his name? Um, Doug Jones playing playing a uh, you know an alien character, which was cool. Um, and this is a this is about an an alien invasion that that happens, and and it begins six months after the invasion, and you know, essentially just like revolution except for aliens neutralize the world's power grid and all the technology and they've de- defeated most of the world's militaries and killed over 90 percent of the human population so damn thanos really came, literally came in his pants after reading that um <laughs> but they have like these mechs and and drones and and you know they have they they're they're taking humans that are left to um experiment on them and, and do interesting things and and Tom Mason is the one of the leaders of a group called the the Second Mass because uh, they're all from Massachusetts and he's a he's a former history professor so he's always relating everything back to like the Revolutionary War or something like that because that was especially, um, but really he was just trying to take care of his three boys, one of which is you know um, the oldest is is a super capable warrior uh, Max the little kid not so much and then uh, his other son uh, Ben. Uh, played by Connor Jessup. Do you remember him? Yeah. Okay. So he gets he gets uh, kidnapped. He was in Lock and Key. That's why. Um, anyway, he he played he played Ty in uh, Lock and Key. 
but he gets kid yeah. he gets you know abducted by the aliens and ends up with like kind of superpowers and the ability to you know kind of work with them so um yeah it, it's interesting and then you had colin cunningham as john pope who is the greatest anti-hero villain of all time um because you never knew from one second if he was going to help or hinder any operation yeah <laughs> um but yeah, it it was just a re- it was a good it was a good fun show and the the last season um the season 4 was bad. Season 5 I didn't bother to watch because I just wanted to keep my good memories of the show. Yeah, I I think I started watching it and I kind of lost kind of like lost the urge to watch it. Sure. I I don't know if it's still on Amazon Prime or I don't think it is. This was a TNT original. And I I will say for being a show that was on TNT and this ran from 2011 to 2015, it had awesome, awesome production quality. Um, Everything about it looked great. And there was a ton of CG and stuff and and it never looked flat or, you know, like it was just uh, something that was just dumped in in the middle of the scene and people running around like Sharknado or something like that. So, yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to do my next one just because you only have one left. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yep. So, all right, so my next one is uh, The Last Man on Earth, um, which we talked actually a little bit last week when we were talking about um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with with Mac. Um, he played he played one of the one of the Phil Millers on on this show. Um, this is Will Forte, and this is Will Forte. I don't know. If, I don't know. Are you a fan of Will Forte? Not really. No. Okay. I, I've never seen an episode. I've never seen like two minutes of this show. Okay. So this is Will Forte at his best, like, cause he's super weird and off putting and awkward. Um, but anyway, he plays a character named Phil Miller. He, uh, he paints signs all over the U S alive in Tucson. So people can try and find him. If there's anybody left, he like hangs out in the white house. He goes around and steals like artifacts and puts them in his little mini mansion in, uh, in Tucson. Um, it's really, really good. And then he meets uh, Christian Skull, uh, that her character, um, and he he's so desperate to have sex, and she won't have sex with him unless he marries her. So he marries her, and then they meet January Jones. <laughs> and so, like, you know, it's like that's just kind of all the stuff that, that keeps happening to uh, – to him as they go uh jason sudeikis plays his brother um mike miller who was uh an astronaut so he was stuck up at the international space station when when most of the population died and things like that it's just a really funny show it it went on for four seasons um and it was it was just funny it was it it unfortunately ended on a cliffhanger but it it was just one of those little weird it was each episode each season was only 13 episodes uh ish and uh, this it was done by Lord Miller, so um, it just that should tell you everything you need to know about the uh, yeah. the level of, of of comedy that was that was on the show. But it's well worth watching. It's on, um, I think it's still on Hulu. It may not be. I don't. I don't know. But um, but it's a great take on the apocalypse because for the most part, everything's left, and and um, Phil actually figures out how to turn the power back on. So, you know, everywhere they go, they're able to have electricity and things like that. Cool. So, yeah, yeah I haven't different. watched this. I, I know. Um, it, like, I've seen it a lot, like, the, the you know, some yep. of the promos for it when it was on. I just never turned it on. Yeah. Watch it. Um, Mark Boone, um, Bobby Elvis from um, yeah. Sons of Anarchy. Uh, he's a reoccurring character for a little bit, and he's he's great. Um, what, what he does and, and pretty violent as well. Um, Kristen Wiig has a really good cameo in the in the fourth season, just uh, as does Chris Elliott, who I'm I'm I love Chris Elliott. So yeah, uh, it's it's just uh, it's cool. They end up going to Mexico. So, <laughs> important question. Yeah, does this show have a laugh track? It does not. It is not. It's not a sitcom. Okay. I mean, it's a multi cam. Uh, wait, is it single cam? Yeah, no, it's single cam. But no, there's no laugh track. So, okay, good. Because yeah. that's how I like side on stuff now <laughs> you think i'm gonna watch a show yeah, with a I'll laugh track dude? i don't watch la- i don't watch laugh tracks the only Shop. show that i will still watch Shop. that has laugh tracks is seinfeld yeah so pretty much do you remember the show sports night yes i never watched it but i i think it, it used to be on like, like some streaming service. it's still I, I think it's still on hulu it might not be but um the uh the first season maybe the first like 
somewhere between four and six episodes, there's a laugh track, and then they realize, wait, we're better than this. We don't need a laugh track, and just dropped it. <laughs> and so, yeah. good. Anyway, all right. What's your last show? Okay, so the last one isn't was another TNT show, uh, The Last Ship, and kind of like you know when I said waking up to chaos. This one is not quite as bad. So the, the premise is that there's some type of bird flu going on that uh, this this military command commanded by Eric Dane, who he actually left uh, Grey's Anatomy for this role. And so he's the captain of this ship, uh, the, uh, Nathan, was it Nathan James, I think. And uh, he's taken this scientist uh, played by Rona Mitra which I love her. She was in an underrated movie, uh, Doomsday. Doomsday, yeah. <laughs> That was that was a fun apocalyptic movie. Yeah, I almost put that uh, on my movie list. I almost did too. <laughs> uh, so the the idea they they go to the Arctic or something to figure out, and they and they're out of communication. They you know there's no communication with the mm-hmm. outside world. So they come back in the port, and everything has just gone to shit. With the virus, has killed like I forgot how much a percentage of people. And then you have like militias coming up. So up people up to no good all over the place and the first two seasons are is about trying to figure out a cure and then dep- dispensing the cure across the world mm. and then from there it changes to a more political aspect of trying to get everything trying to right the world mm. and like right now i'm on um i, I restart i i never i watched the first four seasons and i think i'm on se- i'm on season five right now um, okay but it, it's still on Hulu, like all like the whole oh, okay. season, series cool. is on Hulu. Yeah, my father in law so was like I, a big I fan realize, of this, again, and he was always trying to get me to watch it, and I just never did. Yeah, and his um his XO is played by uh, Alec Ball or uh, Adam Baldwin. Adam Baldwin, uh, yeah. Was, which this show would not yeah. get made now if Adam Baldwin was a part of it, because he's been canceled. Oh, it's, what do you why? He's been canceled. He's like super really? like right wing. Like can, some might call him alt right, oh. and. I don't know if they'd be right or wrong, but like, well, yeah, I mean, he's this, been, he's been very the, outspoken. I think he's a big Trump. So guy. this show was, yeah, yeah. So this show has been on. Uh, I I can't remember when it started, but I uh, check it out. Yeah, it's a not. Uh, at, yeah. It's I'm sorry. Um, it's a nice mix of you know that. Okay, how are we going to bring the world back to? Okay, we we've got the cure now. How are we going to reestablish you know governmental rule and all these pockets of you know you know guerrilla warfare, all this stuff? And you know, there's some really cool naval battles. And you know, the la- the one episode I was watching um not too long ago uh, was them. You know, they were in China and you know had th- these three Chinese vessels, and then trying to hide behind islands. So a lot of cool military kind of tactics and stuff like that oh, cool. it's a it's a lot of good stuff um really good characters and again no characters are not safe there are several characters throughout the uh throughout the seasons that have died uh main characters um and also speaking of our boy uh stillwell is in it like he's oh, he's one nice. of the main supporting characters okay. so cool I forgot his his real his uh, his name, but uh, yeah. So I, I really like this show. I think it shows that you know, er, you know Eric Dane and I used to watch. I, w- I used to watch Grace for the first couple seasons, and then I bailed on it. But um, he is Eric Dane is a really well. You remember him in Euphoria, yeah. Um, but I really like him as an actor. Um, he he can he really can he commands the screen, and he okay. does. He's he's a really good captain on this ship. Cool, cool. Uh, so yeah, it's. I, not, I, I think it's. That. I think it might be on my watch list as well as one of those ones that's just been there for a long time. So yeah, cool, cool. All right, so my last one is. Um, it's really the only show on CBS I've ever really, really loved. Jericho. Um, that's. What. That is one show that I I think I started watching it when it first came out and I kind of is one of those things that I lost track of. Yeah. So it's, it's only two seasons. It's not very long. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a post-apocalyptic America where, um, it's the aftermath of a nuclear attack on 23 major cities in the, uh, continuous, uh, United States. And, uh, yeah, it starts Skeet Ulrich, Lenny, Lenny, Jane, Lenny James, Ashley Scott, which 
you know, she's a show killer. So that's why it only went on for two seasons. Um, you had major dad on there. Isai Morales, um, what was in the second season, Gerald McRaney, you know, major dad, um, mm-hmm. Pamela Reed. So yeah, it, it, uh, Alicia Coppola was in this. She was a really good character. Um, but yeah, no, this was, this was just a really good, like drama about these people who were living outside of Kansas, who, you know, uh, it was like a small farming town in Kansas and they were all, you know, they were a community before all this started. And, you know, it dealt with like, what, what does it look like with, um, you know, with, 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 with like power struggles. Um, one of the interesting things is like they get power and then the U S government set off an EMP. Um, and, or they are, I'm sorry, they're there. It's alluded that, uh, the, the, the U S government set off an EMP after, after the fact to, to disable even more electronics. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's just a really cool show. Um, Jake, who is his Skeet Ulrich's character, like you're introduced to him and, and you think he's this like loser guy. And it turns out he was kind of a mercenary. Um, and you know, so, so he had run off from his family and he was coming back cause I think the grandma died or something. And he was trying to get something, but yeah, and then the second season, it was all about the new, uh, the new uh, Allied States of America, uh, which governed m- most of the Western U.S., um, except for the Independent Republic of Texas. Um, so, yeah, of course, Texas, right? Um, so yeah, it was it was good. Isai Morales was one of the governor or was one of the generals in the ASA. Um, but yeah, and and so. It was it was just a really cool and interesting show. Um, I always liked it. Kind of tickled me that Columbus, Ohio, became the the um, the capital of the U.S. Um, after everything yeah. happened. So, um, you know, because they were Buckeye strong. Yeah. I hate the Buckeyes. I'm out. <laughs> You're out. <laughs> no, thank you. Anything that puts Columbus in a positive light, Columbus, Ohio. That is no thank you, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's just a good show, and and it's got a lot of really cool, um, just really cool characters, really cool. It's it's really character driven for what it is, and you know, it, it's really different from, you know, the Last Man on Earth, which is like a kind of a high comedy con, con high concept comedy, uh, Falling yeah. Skies, Battlestar Galactica, The Hundred. They're all super sci fi, you know, and this is like what happens to real people when, you know, you stop being polite and you start being apocalyptic. Mm-hmm. Is that, is this still, is this streaming on CBS all access? Uh, I don't think this was ever on CBS all access. It was on CBS, but it was, um, it, oh, we cool. it was a, it was a CBS show. It might be on all access still. Yeah. Um, Cause I've seen it somewhere stream. It, like, I, I don't remember if it was CBS all access when I had that. It was on else. Hulu for a long time. And then, then it was on Amazon <laughs> okay, for a little bit. Um, but okay. I can, I, I'm hold on. I can search. Yeah. Jericho's on, on CBS all access. Um, and then there was, okay. there was a really successful, like, uh, or not, not really successful, but a, a pseudo successful, like third season that was done in, in the comics. Um, they did a comic book oh. continuation. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, it was it was canceled after the first season, and the the fans actually um, put together a whole uh, a whole like campaign to to get it back. Where I think they they were delivering like peanuts or something to uh, to CBS's headquarters, and somebody paid and had a whole bunch of uh, like peanuts dumped on the like the front step of the or you know opening of the new york cbs office or, or something weird like that um but yeah so i mean and, and it was like it was in, in it was in you know it was gonna get canceled like all throughout the first season the whole time um but then they brought it back for a second seven season episode so it's, it's not even 30 episodes but it, it's it's still it was really good and it it was weird because they put it on Saturday nights and, you know, it was just, I don't know. It, it it didn't get the, it never got the, the, the respect it deserved for how good it was. I'll have to check that out. Maybe go yeah. back in time. Yep. 
So, yeah, uh, the peanuts and others preceded donations. So, yeah, they they were they were giving out they were delivering peanuts to to people at CBS and stuff like that. So, uh, because Gerald McElraney's character or um, he was always saying nuts. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, all right. So that's uh the infamous podcast versus the apocalypse. Boom. Yeah. Uh, so. I almost one of the things, and I was oh like, yeah, I guess uh, I already mentioned Doomsday. I, I was yep. going to have that on there, and you know some of the other ones that were like um, this is the end. I almost had that, but I almost put Avengers Endgame on there. But I'm like, it's technically, if you're looking at it like that, it does take place after you know the apocalypse. Yeah, it's apocalyptic. Yeah, but like I, I, I decided to keep it out and keep. Because, you know, again, that's one of my favorite movies, yes. But yeah. I thought these movies were more deserving of being in that apocalyptic category than Avengers Endgame. Yeah, I really wanted to put The Leftovers on my TV series, but then it just made me sad thinking about it and how much I love that show. And I just, it was so good. That's another show I need to finish. Oh, I, dude, I like- the, the Leftovers is amazing. And the end is so weird and awesome and strange and fun. I can't remember if I dark. finished season one or not. So. Um, so, yeah. I know a lot of people, like, love season one. To me, season one is, like, it's it's not a weak season by any of the stretch of the imagination, but I love season two. I just love season mm-hmm. two so much. Um, you know, it might be because Regina King is in there, and she's awesome at everything that she does. But, um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, like, with, with, with the movies, these were, like, the five that I, I really thought about. And it's mm-hmm. so funny that three of my five were from 2013. <laughs> well, I mean, I had, uh, didn't I have two from 2002? Yeah. Yeah. Rain of Fire and uh, 28 Days Later. Yep. From 2002. yep. So I don't know, man. We, uh, we need to look back further next time. Yeah. <laughs> At episode 500, we'll do the Emphasis Podcast versus the Apocalypse. Dose. <laughs> yeah part yeah um but yeah no uh dude i i just want to say like you know i know you've only been on i mean you've been on a few times before like you came on but one thank you for for continuing this journey with me but for everyone who listens man thank you all so much this is this is awesome and to get to 250 episodes i think um you know that is pretty good. That's it's a pretty, pretty cool feat. Um, you know, and, and you know, there was a three month break in there when I when I hurt my hip and I had to go to physical therapy and the only night I had available was Tuesdays. So that was when we recorded back in the day. But uh but yeah, it, it's been fun. And, you know, like Brian and, and, and Johnny before Daryl, like, you know, they're they're a huge part of what made it what it is today and, and successful and yeah, it's awesome. So thank you, thank you all for listening and the emails and the likes and whatever and yeah yeah that's the 250 man that's that's a lot that's some a lot of talk time man. a lot of talk time a lot of energy put into stuff yeah into this so and and you know i hope you guys enjoy like how far it's come since the first episode when it's me and brian sitting across my dining room table each talking into a side of a, a microphone and it sounded horrible <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, awesome. All right. Do you have anything else you want to add? No. Cool. No, well, no, uh, no. Just, just watch out for those um, fire tornadoes. Yep. Fire tornadoes are bad. Hamsters are good. Anyway, we will see you guys next week. Guys, gals, everyone, thanks for listening. Later. Peace. The Infamous Podcast is recorded in Kings Mills, Ohio, just north of Cincinnati, with new episodes out every Sunday. You can find more information about the show online at infamouspodcast.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as at Infamous Podcast. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcasting app. 
If you're enjoying the show, consider giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcast, or check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash infamous podcast for our new tiers and rewards. The Infamous Podcast is hosted and produced by me, Brian Tudor, with music provided by Michael Henry from meetmichaelhenry.com. You can find me on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as at Brian Tudor. So whenever you're listening to the show, have a great day, night, evening, weekend, whenever it is, and we'll see you next time. Later.